Yo, welcome back to the channel. It's the one you've all been waiting for. The tale of Beren and Luffy. And be sure to check out Men of the West. Go and subscribe to them. Legendary, legendary content creators. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you could subscribe to my channel as well. Only if you want to and only if you enjoy the content. Let's get into this. The tale of Beren and Luffy. I'm not going to lie. You guys have overhyped this one for me. It will be a shame if it doesn't hit the hype meter standards. A word. We're just going to go with that. Let's go. It is told in the Lay of Lathian that Baron came stumbling into Doria, grey and bowed, as with many years of woe. So great had been the torment of the road. But wandering in the summer, in the woods of Naldoreth, he came upon Luthien, daughter of Thingol and Melion, at a time of evening under moonrise, as she danced upon the unfading grass in the glades beside Escaldui. Oh, it was love at first sight, Then huh? all memory of his pain departed from him, and he fell into an enchantment, for Luthien was the most beautiful of all the children of Iluvatar. Blue was her raiment, as the unclouded heaven, but her eyes were grey as the starlit evening. Her mantle was sewn with golden flowers, but her hair was dark as the shadows of twilight, as the light upon the leaves of trees, as the voice of clear waters, as the stars above the mists of the world. Such was her glory and her loveliness, and in her face was a shining light. Beautiful. Greetings and well met, my friends. Yoiston here with a remake that I've what been wanting a way to, do to for explain. Quite some time. As many of you may know, I just made a very your eyes video on a little a more than two years ago, time. but seeing Crazy. that this was one of my older videos, and that it is one of the prized gems in Tolkien's works, I feel that it is time for the retelling of this great tale. And so we begin today with part one. I'll link some related videos and articles in the description and cards, but ultimately the greatest source for today's discussion will be the Silmarillion itself, for I am telling the tale as told in the Silmarillion, not the novelization that came out in 2017. Today's video comes directly from the Silmarillion as paraphrased in this script, but I would recommend all of Tolkien's versions of the tale for everyone. Now let's begin our tale, okay. which is perhaps the greatest love story ever written. Wow. In the first age of the world, while the land was still young and before Beleriand was broken, men of the House of Beor resided in the woods of Dorthonion. Now this was still after the Battle of Sudden Flame, the Dagor Bragolok, and so Morgoth held much power in the north and he was hunting for the free people so that he might destroy them all. Barahir, the descendant of Beor, would not abandon his home of Dorthonion to Morgoth the enemy, so he and a group of outlaws remained. He and twelve companions resided near the lake Tarn Iwin, and the waters were held as sacred, and Melian, the wife of Thingol, had hollowed the waters in days of old. Now the presence of these men was known to Morgoth, for word of their deeds went abroad. So the Dark Lord commanded the greatest of his servants, Sauron, to find Barahir and his men, and slay them. Dang. One of Barahir's companions, Gorlin, had wished to return to his wife, Eilenel, from the war, for their love was great, but he found his house sacked and abandoned, and his wife was not to be found. But he had doubt that his wife was dead, so Gorlim often returned there, and it became known to the servants of the enemy. Thus in the autumn of 460 of the First Age, Gorlim snuck away from his companions and came back to his home of old, and he believed that he saw his wife within the home through the window, and her face was worn with grief and hunger. After Gorlim cried aloud, the light in the window was blown out ere the wolves howled, and then he was captured by the hunters of Sauron. Even though he was tormented, Gorlim would not reveal the location of his lord and friends, but well, eventually legend. the orcs promised that he should be returned to his wife if he tells them the location of Barahir and his men. Gorlim wished to be with his wife and for both of them to be set free together, so he was brought into the presence of Sauron and bartered the information for his wife and his reunion with her. Thus he gave away the location of his kin, but Sauron was cruel in return. He did as he promised, for he reunited Gorlim with his wife by slaying him, as the vision of Eilenel in the window was only a phantom devised for trickery. But the location of Barahir had been given, and our story is built on the theme of breaking from bondage to be with one's love, even though for Gorlim it was done cruelly and in treachery. Sauron, man. Ah, <sighs> such a savage. I knew straight away it was going to be Sauron's uh, treachery. 
when uh, when he thought he saw his wife. So evilly smart, man. I just made that word up, but you know it works. But the Lay of Lathian, the tale of Baron and Luthien, is wrought with such a theme, for Lathian means release from bondage. Getting back to our tale, the orcs of Morgoth surrounded the men of Dorthonion in the hours before dawn and slew them all save one, Baron, who had been sent far away on a perilous mission of spying by his father Barahir. Whilst Baron dreamt that night, quote, he dreamed that carrion birds sat thick as leaves upon bare trees beside a mirror, and blood dripped from their beaks, end quote. The wraith of Gorlim also came in the dream, and he spoke to Baron of his treachery and death. Oh. so that Baron might warn his father Barahir. And so Baron made haste back to his home only to find Jeez. carrion birds that rose from the ground and sat in the alder trees. And so Baron buried his father's bones and rose a cairn over them, swearing vengeance for Barahir. Thus Baron pursued the orcs and found them at Rivil's well, above the fen of Sadak. With his woodcraft and stealth, he found his way to the leader of the orcs, and the captain boasted about his deeds, raising the hand of Barahir that he was going to show to Sauron as proof of their victory. The orc knew not his doom until it was too late, and he was slain by Baron, who recovered his father's hand and ring, and fled from the other orcs. Hell yeah. Likely Baron buried the hand of his father with the rest of his remains, and the son took the ring which once belonged to Finrod Felagun, and it was proof of the elf king's oath to the kin of Barahir. And so, for another four years, Baron remained a solitary outlaw, becoming so deadly to the servants of the enemy that Morgoth set a price upon his head no less than the bounty upon Fingon, High King of the Noldor. Wow. Baron feared not death, only bondage and captivity. During that time, he made friends with all good birds and beasts. Oh. And he ate no flesh or slew any living thing that was not in the service of the Dark Lord. But eventually, in the winter of 464, Sauron brought an army werewolves came with him, so Baron was forced to flee from the forest and go southwards. Through arid Gorgoroth and Dungortheb, Baron was forced to tread, where there was no food for man or elf, but there were monsters, some of which were the spawn of Ungoliant. But Baron came through, and he passed through the mazes of Melion that wove about the kingdom of Thingol. But Melion had foretold this, for Baron carried with him a great doom. And so he came into the woods of Naldoreth in the summer of 464, and met Luthien, who was dancing beneath the trees. But she vanished from his sight, and he became as one lost in a spell. He had no name for the maiden, so he cried out, Tenuviel, a poetic word for nightingale, meaning daughter of twilight. He wandered, and he saw her afar in the autumn and winter. And spring eventually came, and her song and voice dissipated the winter. Baron silence fell, and he cried to Nuviel once again, and she was halted. Baron came to her, and she looked at him and was stricken with love and a new doom. She slipped from his arms and vanished, and he swooned as one slain but by was she real? grief. He fell into sleep and awoke cold and alone. In his mind he reached out to grasp that which was vanished. Thus he began to suffer from his new fate. Damn. But eventually Luthien returned to him and put her hand in his. Together they walked, and had great joy in the spring and summer, and they kept secret. They knew greater happiness and joy in that time than any other children of Iluvatar have known. I just, I, I wish he explained why she was just there in the forest. Or is that just an elf thing to just, you know, I, maybe she's from the forest, I don't know. But can they teleport and stuff? Can they vanish and stuff? Let me know. I, I'm a bit confused about that little section. Such joy would end, however, when Daron the minstrel, who also loved Luthien, espied these secret encounters from afar and reported them to his lord and Luthien's father, Thingol. Thingol was then wrathful, for he loved Luthien and held her above the princes of the Eldar, let alone men. He spoke in grief and amazement with Luthien who would tell him nothing until he swore not to slay the man nor imprison him. Thingol sent his servants forth to bring Baron before him, but Luthien stalled and led him before the throne as an honored guest. Thingol spoke in anger, and Melion was silent. Thingol asked Baron who he was, and the man was unable to answer, for he was filled with fear and wonder at the halls of Menegroth. Luthien answered that he was Baron, son of Barahir, and she spoke of his renown. Thingol would have Baron speak for himself. 
The king then asked him why he came there and why he should not be punished. Baron looked up into the eyes of Luthien and at the face of her mother Melion, and it seemed words were put into his mouth, and fear left him. Answering with pride and telling of his perils, Baron said nothing would keep him from Luthien, the treasure he desired. For his insolence, nice. the hall grew silent, and many were afraid he would be slain. Thingle said that he would not slay him, though he earned it, for Thingle had sworn a hasty oath. He insulted Baron, but Baron replied that he could be given death earned or unearned, but he would not be named the insults Thingle had given him. For Baron spoke of his house, his father, and the ring given to his father by Fenrod Felagund. All looked upon the ring of Barahir, and Melian told Thingle to ease his wrath, for the man would not be slain by the Elf King, and his fate was free and far off, although it was bound to Thingle's. Melian told Thingle to take heed, and the Elf King looked at his daughter and had protective and proud thoughts. Breaking the silence, Thingle said that the deeds of Baron's father would not be enough to win his daughter and he too desired something. Thus Thingle wrought the doom of the Noldor into the doom of Doriath, for he told Beren that he should return to Doriath with the Silmaril from Morgoth's crown in his hand, and then Luthien may lay her like, hand in his, and still Thingle should be seen as generous. Didn't make it easy Beren for him, accepted did you? this charge, for he called it a small price, quote, And when we meet again, my hand shall hold a Silmaril from the Hell Iron yeah. Crown. For you have not looked the last upon Beren, son of Barahir. End quote. Beren looked at Melian, <laughs> who said not, and he bade farewell to Luthien before leaving Menegroth alone. Melian told Thingle that while it was cunning counsel, it wove the fate of Doriath into that of a mightier realm, whether Beren succeeded or not. To this, Thingle responded that he valued those he loves and cherishes above all, and that there was no hope or fear of Beren returning. Luthien was silent, and sang not in Doriath, and a silence fell upon the woods. Thus Baron went forth from Doriath and began his quest, and it is likely that his wisdom tempered his pride, for he knew that he would need aid. And so he went to Nargothron, the kingdom of Finrod Felagund. Upon the guarded plain Finrod's elves kept unceasing watch, and although Baron saw no living thing, he knew he was being watched, and cried aloud often his name, and that he should be taken to the king. Thus the elves stopped him and saw his ring. Going by night, they led Baron to their home and to the king. Felagund needed no ring to recognize the kin of Beor and Barahir, and so the two took counsel together behind closed doors. Baron told him of his quest, and Finrod knew it was time to fulfill his oath. He said it was plain that Thingol desired the death of Baron, but Baron's fate went beyond Thingol. I may have missed it, and I'm sorry, and... Let me know. Who's Fingal's dad? Who? So the king who sent, basically Luthien's dad. Who is? Who is that? I feel like I know, but I don't want to guess because I'll probably just get. Oh no, you're wrong. You're not paying attention. Was purpose stirring the oath of fame. We've had some people more. like that in the comments. Unfortunately, Thus he knew Kelegorm and Kurufin, who resided in his halls, would be stirred to wrath, as would be their followers. And Finrod was right, for the king addressed his people and told of his oath to Barahir's kin. And the Feanorians recalled their oath of reclaiming the Silmarils and pursuing any non-Feanorian who took them. They stirred fear for the future in the people of Nargothrond. The sons thought of power, but the doom of Mandos came upon them and they hoped to send Finrod alone to his death, so that they might usurp his seat of power in Nargothrond. But it was not to be so, for even though Finrod cast his crown upon the ground, and said that his people could forsake him, but he would not forsake Baron, ten elves declared that they would accompany the man and elf king, and until a time when Finrod would return, there should be a steward. Thus Orodreth, who in the published Silmarillion was the brother of Finrod, but in later publications was the nephew of Finrod, took up the stewardship of Nargothrond. Ordreth's lineage is said to be an editorial mistake within the Silmarillion, so I personally consider him to be the nephew of Finrod. Okay. But either way, Finrod gave his crown to his close kin for stewardship. Anyway, in the autumn of 465, Finrod set out with his elves and Baron towards Engband, and through the powers of the Elf King, the company was disguised as a band of orcs. But as they went north so between cool. Erd Wethrin and the highlands of Tower Nufuin, Sauron, who was in his tower upon the Isle of Werewolves, Tull and Gaurhoth, became aware of them, 
for they went in haste and did not stop to report their deeds, as other bands of orcs did. Thus Sauron sent to waylay them, and the band was brought before the lieutenant of Morgoth. Sauron attempted to reveal them, and Finrod wished to guard them. So the contest in Songs of Power broke out between these two. But the Maya had the mastery. Quote, Thunder rumbles, the fires burn, and Finrod fell before the throne. We know all about End this part. Quote. Thus their disguises were revealed, but none betrayed their purpose. So they were cast into a deep pit, and from time to time a werewolf would devour one of the companions, who all stayed true to their lord Finrod and the quest. As a quick side note, it seems that the Ring of Barahir stayed with Baron during this time and was not removed, which is interesting because of the beginning of this tale. Perhaps the servants of Sauron did not know or care for what it was. Anyway, in this time, horror came upon Luthien's heart, and she went to Melion for counsel, and learned that Baron was in the pits of Tol in Gaurhoth. And so she resolved to go to his aid, and she sought the help of Daron the minstrel. But, since Daron loved her, he betrayed her purpose yet again, and he caused a house to be built in a beech tree that would serve as Luthien's prison. It is told in the way of Lathian how she escaped, as she used her powers to cause her hair to grow, and with it she wove a robe that wrapped her with shadow, Sick. and was laden with the spell of sleep. With the spare strands she made a rope, and got down from the window, and the guards fell into sleep. Genius. Thus she flew from Doriath. But Kelegorm and Kurufin, who had gone from Nargothrond to hunt the wolves of Sauron, were about. They took with them Huon the Hound, who was given to Kelegorm by Arome the Hunter in Valinor. Huon found Luthien, who escaped the sights of others, for he picked up her scent, and so the Hound brought her before Kelegorm. Learning that Kelegorm was a prince of the Noldor, she revealed herself and told her purpose. He became enamored with her and promised her aid if she returned with him to Nargothrond, not telling that he knew already of Baron's quest. Thus they returned to Nargothrond, and Luthien was betrayed, for they held her, and she was only allowed to speak to the two brothers. They proposed to let Finrod and Baron perish, and to keep Luthien and force Thingol to give her to Kelegorm to wed. Then they thought that none should seek the Silmarils until they had the might of all elf kingdoms behind them. Orodreth had not the political power to withstand them, for they swayed the minds and hearts of the people of Nargothrond, and Kelegorm sent messengers to Thingol, arguing his suit. But this tale is about release from bondage, and Huon, who was true of heart, found love for Luthien, and grieved at her captivity. He came to Luthien's chamber often, and laid before her door, and he felt that evil had come to Nargothrond. Luthien spoke to him often as well, and told him of Baron, who was a friend to all birds and beasts that Aww. did not serve Morgoth. Huon understood, but was himself not permitted to speak, except for three times in his life, ere his death. Huon spoke for the first time one night, for he brought Luthien her cloak, and gave her counsel. Then he led her through secret paths out of Nargothrond, and bore her north as her steed with great swiftness. At this time only Baron and Finrod remained alive in the pits, and Sauron wanted to keep the elf lord for last, for he perceived that he was a Noldo of great might and wisdom and that the secret of this errand laid with him. But when the wolf came for Baron, Finrod used his power to burst forth from his chains, and he slew the beast with hands and teeth, but he met his own beast. end there, and bade farewell to Baron after he had fulfilled his oath. And in that hour Luthien and Huon came, and upon the bridge that led to Sauron's isle she sang a song that could not be hindered by walls of stone. Baron heard, and saw the stars above him, and heard the nightingales singing in the trees. Baron answered in a song of challenge, made in praise to the seven stars and the sickle of the Valar that Varda had put in the north, as a sign for the fall of Morgoth. Baron's strength left him, and he fell into darkness. Luthien heard his answer and sang a song of greater power. Wolves howled, and the island trembled. Sauron in his tower She's was glad so at hearing her, for he hoped to make her a captive for Morgoth. Thus he sent wolf after wolf to the bridge, each of whom Huon slew silently. Huon slew all of them, and eventually Sauron sent forth Draugwin, the sire of the werewolves of Angband. Their fight was long and brutal, but eventually Draugwin returned to Sauron, and told him of Huon before dying at his feet. Damn. Sauron knew, as did many others, that Huon was to be slain by the greatest wolf that ever lived, 
and Sauron thought it could be him, for he turned himself into the mightiest werewolf that had yet walked the earth. The horror of his coming was so great that Huon leapt aside, and then Sauron sprang towards Luthien, and she fainted before his menace and breath. But Luthien cast a fold of her cloak before his eyes, and a drowsiness came upon Sauron. That is when Huon jumped upon him, and the battle took place. Howls echoed far off, and the watchers on the walls of Arid Wethrin were dismayed. But Huon retained the mastery, and Luthien threatened to send Sauron back to Morgoth as a ghost to endure his never-ending wrath unless she was given the mastery of the tower. Sauron relented, and Luthien had won through the prowess of Huon and Sauron was released. Should have killed Sauron him! Sauron took the form of a vampire and fled, going to Tower Nufuin, the forest of Dorthonion, which had been the forest where Baron once dwelt. Thus the gates and walls were thrown down, and the pits laid bare. Many were freed and went forth, but Baron did not. Huon and Luthien searched for him, and Luthien found him mourning by Felagund, and he laid still. Uh. Luthien thought he had perished, and wrapped her arms around him and fell into dark forgetfulness. But Baron returned to the light, and lifted her up, and they looked upon each other. And the day came, and shone upon them. That is where we will end today's portion of the tale, and I shall so return next good. week with the second part. You... For although Baron and Luthien were reunited, the most dangerous part of their tale still lies ahead, as Baron has an oath to fulfill. Mm -hmm. From this part of the tale of Baron and Luthien, we see the strength of pure love and friendship. Yep. Without the aid of Finrod and Huon, the two children of Aluvatar who have found ill fates. He's a good boy. But it is their love that binds this tale of release from bondage together. We shall see these themes present once again in the next part. Great video. Great, great video. Now I know why you guys kept saying react to this. Um, man, shout out to the men of the West. Go and subscribe to them. You know, it's an amazing video when I'm quiet for most of it. I don't like to do that, but I'm just in awe of what's happening. Do you know what I mean? Um, such such a great story so far. Um, wow. Take note: she was feminine, but not weak for her. her femininity. Was in fact the source of her strength. So many authors and politicians don't get it, but Tolkien he got it. Cool. Another remake that blows Hollywood out of the water. Keep up the great work. <laughs> okay, okay. There may be spoilers down there. So, uh, yeah. No spoilers in the comments. I'll, uh, I'll... How about this? Uh, I think I'm at 295 subscribers. Shout out to every single one of you. At 300 subscribers, I'll upload part two. So it could be as soon as possible. It's, uh, well, whenever we hit 300 subscribers. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed yourself, and uh, let me know in the comments down below what else you want me to react to. Thanks for watching. Peace out, God bless, and I'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video. I really appreciate your time. Please hit the subscribe button. We're on the road to 500 subscribers. It's so simple. Just click the red button and follow all my socials. I stream daily on twitch.tv forward slash MRPG as well. And if you want to support the channel further, the link is in the description to tip the channel. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Peace out. God bless and take care.